competencies you have to have as a PCIT therapist is you have to be able to do the 10, 10, and 10 as a parent would before you can coach it. So we are going to be working toward that today. So what we're going to do is we want you to get into groups of three and we will have one person be the coach, one person be the child, one person be the parent. We will do that for five minutes a piece of very well behaved children because we want people to have, because quite honestly, in CDI, kids typically behave. Uh, we don't see a lot of misbehavior, particularly toward the later sessions of, of CDI. Kids don't misbehave a lot during CDI. So we want you to be very well behaved children so that your uh, folks can have some skills to work with. As a child, please be sure to do a couple of things. One is to talk. So that, they, so that your parent has a chance to reflect. Uh, be sure not to talk too much so your parent has a chance to do some behavior descriptions and labeled phrases, okay? So we will do uh, five minutes. Don't switch until you hear my loud, obnoxious voice saying switch. I might even sing it just to be a little more obnoxious this morning. <laughs> So anyway, uh, so don't switch until I say switch, so that way everybody kind of stays with the same thing. We're going to have some ex experienced coaches come around and coach the coach uh, and kind of do some coach encouraging as we are doing that. So with no further explanation, is that clear? Okay, so five minutes apiece, groups of three. If you don't have any toys near you, it is time to be a little antisocial, go steal some stories. Also, and I'm about to date myself, uh, we have the American Bandstand stage up here. Uh, so uh, for those of y'all who get that reference, you get to come up here and uh, play on stage. You're not being recorded. We just have toys already set up here. So if somebody doesn't have any toys around there and they want to come on the show stage, come on up. It'll be awesome. Uh, uh, <laughs> so with that, we'll go ahead and get rolling, OK? So go ahead. Uh, for the internet audience, what we just did here live is we just had a role play in which uh, folks were getting an opportunity to practice some CDI coaching, and we're now going to take some questions from that experience. So, in our little role play, the um, child kind of oh, sorry. turned the Legos apart and one kind of like hey, and so the parent asked the question of, are you okay? And so that's mm -hmm. the Uh, in that situation, I probably would not zing the parent for asking a question. If we were coding for mastery, it would count against the parent, but they get three questions or commands or you know, any of the three of the avoid things, they get three of those, so it wouldn't kill her. So, but that was an excellent question. And, and, and sometimes real life things come up like that. For example, uh, one of the things that will sometimes happen uh, uh, for me is that my therapy room will become a discriminant stimulus for children going to the bathroom and they'll go to the bathroom about 10 minutes in and and when that happens and the parent gets real concerned they go can I take my child to the potty and I go yes absolutely yes there's only one time that that might not be appropriate but more, more you know usually we want that child to go to the bathroom and not in my office. Uh, it's like, it happens from time to time. Ray will be telling you about that. But, <laughs> but generally speaking, it's like, you want to do that. Yes? I have sort of a general question, not about coaching specifically, but in the context of teaching the parents these skills, if they ask you questions like, what about outside of special time? You know, and I know that you said very explicitly, like, don't do an hour of special time, just do five minutes of special time. I mean, I, I assume that this is going to, like, um, color the relationship between the parent and the mm -hmm. child outside of it because it's going to strengthen their bond. But, are, you know, should the parent, I mean, what should you say to them if they ask you about, you know, using pride skills outside of that time? Absolutely, yes. One of the things about PCIT is that it's kind of a sneaky therapy because we have this five minutes of very doable special play time, this five minutes of very doable practice time, but those parenting skills are going to seep into the entire relationship. And so if a parent was to say, well, is it okay to give labeled praises during the day? Yes. Is it okay to give behavior descriptions during the day? Yes. What if they say it more from the point of view of like, you know, 
I've been doing great with the special time, but outside of that, I really just don't feel like I've been doing enough. I feel like I'm not doing my part. What do you? What kind of thing would you say to that? Have, have parents ever said that to you? One, I've never had a parent say that to me. Have y'all ever had that occur? No, it's usually the reverse. Is uh -huh. that they're like, oh yeah, I, I didn't get my five minutes in, but I'm really I'm doing a good job getting it in at other times. Other times. Oh, okay. I and got so it. we have to say that's wonderful and. You gotta have the five minutes of special play time. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you so and, much. And, uh, and and one of the other things, and y'all, we we talked about this, but a lot of times parents will say, "Well, can I just keep going?" And my answer to that is, you can keep playing, but try to turn your CDI off, CDI brain off after five minutes because we want to give your brain a break. We don't want to wear our parents out. It's kind of like the concept of overtraining. Uh, it's good to do push-ups. It's probably a bad idea to say, I'm going to go do 2,000 push-ups today, right? You could hurt yourself that way. Same thing with, I'm going to go do two hours of CDI today. Your brain might become mush by the end of that, uh, or at least you'd be very, very tired. Other questions about coaching or about the CDI process that comes up during your experience? The organization of the room. It's only a table with two chairs and nothing else to call the attention of the child? Correct. It t generally speaking, a perfect CDI room is just going to have a table, two chairs, three to four toys, and that's it. Uh, and there's a lot of, and one of the reasons why we like to have that clean of a room is so that the focus becomes the interaction between the parent and child and not the really cool slide that's in the corner or, in, or not the, all the beautiful pictures that are on the wall. Plus, having a really clean room helps in PDI. The uh, selection of the toys. The because everything that I, that I got was food, but I don't know if it was mine. Sure. Food, you know, food, the food toys are actually an interesting selection. Food toys are good CDI toys. Uh, they are not my favorite CDI toys, but they're good CDI toys. And interestingly enough, a lot of times kids have been neglected, really orient toward the food toys. Uh, but good CDI toys, you almost always want to have either a Lego or a Duplo set, depending on the age of the child. Those are just wonderful. Uh, one of the things that we don't have an example of in this room, but, but you always want to kind of have one of those kind of toys, is something like a play school farm or a play school house. Or uh, I have a play school amusement park, which is really cool. Uh, and so you want to have something along those lines uh, because it gives children lots of little things that the parent can describe. And, uh, you know, and having some crayons or some non-messy art supplies is a really good idea to have. And once again, you're, you're also going to vary your toys a little bit depending upon the, uh, the child. Uh, so for example, I've got kids who really love my castle set. And so my, my non-violent castle set is always out for, uh, for certain of my kids. I've got other kids that really love the tinker toys. Uh, and, uh, and that's always going to be out. But I try to, in my therapy room, and I encourage parents to do this, I do try to vary my toys up a little bit. Uh, one, to prevent the parents from getting bored, and interestingly enough, to keep me from getting bored. It, it's much more fun as a therapist to have the, the people play, having different opportunities of toys to play with. Uh, and it's a great, great reason to go yard sailing. <laughs> you know, to go yard sailing and pick up very cheap toys for your playroom. Uh, do it all the time. All right. Other questions? Do you have parents who have you know, perhaps ADHD or have had a brain trauma and they have difficulty processing so much information? Do you tailor to limit, even during the later sessions, the amount of um, you know, feedback that you're giving them? Not typically, because with the amount of coaching, the amount of coaching that we do actually helps typically the parents stay focused. Uh, and you'll see that with the child during CDI. You'll have, a, you'll have a kid with ADHD who's never really played with a toy for longer than five or 10 minutes, and they will stay focused on that toy for 20 or 30 minutes during the CDI session because of the pride skills. And you're doing pride skills with this parent who has some attention, attention difficulties, and it tends to work the same way. It tends to help focus the parent. Uh, it can be a little distracting at first for the parent as they're getting used to the bug in the ear. Uh, and I always normalize that. You know, I talk about how, you know, this is kind of, admittedly, this is a little weird. I'm talking to you from behind a mirror. I'm watching what you do. I'm keeping score. 
you know, this is, this is a little, this is a little different. And, uh, and it's got to be weird, but you'll get used to it. And, you're, and it will help you out as we go along further. So, and it usually takes parents about a week or two before they really kind of get into the flow of uh, enjoying that. What's that? Oh, oh my, uh, my fellow master trainers are telling me that we need to only take one more question because we need to roll. So there's one more question? Yes, um, my question was if the child has a tantrum, or have you ever experienced that the child has a tantrum because you're ending the five minutes of play? And then if you did, then how would you approach that? Yes, and you ignore it. Yes, and you ignore it. And sometimes that makes you about five minutes late for your next client. <laughs> and uh, one, one of the things that I will tell you, and you'll learn this about PDI, sometimes you're a little late <laughs> for your next client. It just help, happens. And we'll give you some tips on that as we move forward. All right, so we're about to talk about parent-directed interaction overview, and I'm going to give you all eight rules of effective commands. PDI is very different than CDI because with CDI, it is something that we do for five minutes every day. Eventually, PDI is something that is going to be done when a parent needs it. So whenever during the day that a parent needs a child to do something, PDI comes into play. Uh, PDI always begins with a positively stated command. There is never a time that it doesn't end with a, that doesn't begin with a positively stated command. PDI always ends when the child complies. So to a certain degree, we expect 100% obedience from our children that we're doing PDI with because we don't end PDI until the child obeys. PDI emphasizes consistency and predictability. And all behavioral systems tell you we emphasize consistency and predictability. PDI is consistency and predictability on steroids. Okay, <laughs> It is consistency and predictability cubed. It is whatever metaphor makes consistency and predictability sounds bigger in your head. I don't think I can say consistency and predictability again without muffing it. So we will move on okay, to uh, with, with this, we in PDI, we have a gradual generalization from clinic exercises to real life discipline. So we're going to move from clinic minding exercises that we only practice in the clinic. We're going to move that up to where they're doing some minding practice at home, and then we'll move that up until we are having all day parent-directed interaction whenever the parent needs it. Now, because we are in a system where we are going to give consequences to children for not complying, we want to use the most effective commands that we can use so that the child is more likely to be reinforced for obeying. We essentially want to give the most fair commands. We want to give the <coughs> commands that are going to be most likely for the child to be obeyed. And at this point in time, uh, I do always like to point out the theoretical orientation of PCIT and that we very much are base ourselves on sort of a Baumrindian system. It's like we believe that the best parenting is when a parent uh, provides structure and provides nurture. In the CDI, we have a lot of nurture. With PDI, we're coming in with a structure. There are some parenting systems that don't believe that the parent should be in an authority position. And in PCIT, we believe that the parent is an authority figure for the child. And we believe that it's comforting for a child to know that somebody is in charge and helping structure their lives. And so we are, <coughs> a lot of times folks will will come around and, and try to soften the word commands. I'll sometimes use directives. Uh, but honestly, we're giving commands. We're expecting them to be obeyed. So we believe that children obeying their parents is a positive behavior. So with that, there's some things that you can do with your commands that are going to make it much more likely that a child will obey them. The first one is that your command should be direct rather than indirect. You want to leave no illusion of choice to the child. You want to make sure that the child knows that you are giving a command. Okay? So for example, 
you want to tell the child to please take your hand out of the cookie jar rather than will you please take the hand out of the cookie jar, right? You want them to know that it is a command. Uh, when, my child, when my middle daughter was four, we were teaching her how to set the table. And I come in one day and I go, Bryn, would you like to set the table? And she looks at me just as sweet as she could be. No, <laughs> she's doing something else, right? She wasn't being disobedient. She just didn't know I was giving her command. I was asking her a choice. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story to illustrate this principle. I have been married for seven days, okay? And I am just dog in love. I am just swooning in love. I will do anything that I can to make my wife happy. We are driving down the road in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, uh, and she looks over the side and she says, would you like to get some ice cream? No. And, uh, and I'm just driving along. You can feel the temperature in the car go down, right? <laughs> and I look over there. She's mad at me. And I go, oh, did you want some ice cream? Right? And she goes, yes, I did. And I go, oh, OK. And I pulled over, got some ice cream, right? You know, husbands don't understand indirect commands. <laughs> okay. This is true, OK? It's like, this is true. Husbands don't understand indirect commands, neither do preschoolers. And so <laughs> it's very important to give those direct commands. Let them know that there's no illusions of choice. Please get me some ice cream. Happy to do it for you. You know. But if you say, will you, it's confusing. And it's confusing to the child. Okay? You want your commands to be positively stated. Uh, you want to say, come sit beside me, rather than don't run around the room. You want to tell the child what to do, rather than what not to do. This is very good because it avoids criticism of the child. Okay. It avoids the don'ts, the nots, the stops, the quits, the no's. And there's a couple of reasons why stating the command positively is more likely to be obeyed. One is if you give a positive command, it's a one-step decision for the child. Okay. Please walk. Okay. Well, that's, you know, the child is either going to walk or not. Please stop running. If you're my kid, what you then do is you start skipping, okay? Or you start sprinting, or you start jumping, right? If you give a don't or a not command, you have moved from a one-step process to a two-step process. You have to not only stop what you're doing, but you have to choose what to do next. Also, recognize from a brain development perspective, it is much, much harder for young children to inhibit behavior rather than to start behavior. If you've ever played the game, uh, children's game red light, green light, right? You will know that when you say green light, the kids take off. And when you say red light, it takes them a second to stop their running. And this is true for almost any behavior. It is harder to inhibit than to start something. So we just make it easier for the child. The third, quite honestly, is just human nature. And this is especially true for oppositional kids. We don't like to be told no, right? Are any of y'all like me? And when you see the no admittance sign, you go, yeah, I can go in there. <laughs> just, just, they say that they don't want me to go in there. I can do that, right? All right, you want to give your commands one at a time. Please put your shoes in the closet rather than please put your shoes in the closet, take a bath, and brush your teeth. Uh, the reason why you want to do this is because it's going to give you an opportunity to praise the child for every compliance. And also, a lot of preschoolers, and admittedly also a, a lot of husbands, we have difficulty <laughs> following more than one command at a time. When my wife was pregnant with our first child, it was dead of winter. And she would say, honey, please go downstairs and turn the air conditioner on and give me a, get, get me a glass of water. And so I'd trot downstairs, <laughs> OK? I'd go get a glass of water. I'd get halfway up. My wife, knowing me, says, did you turn the air conditioning on? No, silly me, it's winter. And I'd go back down. I'd turn the air conditioning on. I'd put the glass on the table, <laughs> right? And then start going back upstairs. And she goes, do you got the glass of water? Oh, now all of those times, I, once again, wanted to make my wife happy. She's carrying my child. I want to show my love. But 
have a tough time handling more than one thing at once. And young children are exactly like that. You also want to avoid global commands that are actually several commands. For example, clean your room. All right. How many times have you ever told your child, clean your room, and you go in and it is still destroyed? I thought I told you to clean your room. It is clean, right? They put one thing away, they have cleaned their room. Okay? Clean your room is actually a series of commands. And so you want to avoid those global commands to give them a better chance. This will help the parent to know when the child is obeying. It will help the child to remember the command. You want your commands to be very specific. Okay? Now, I don't know about y'all's mamas, but my mama, when I was a kid, she had this command I heard all the time. Be careful. Okay? Be careful at what? Right? <laughs> be careful walking on the roof. Be careful, be careful playing chicken with the cars as you're sledding down the hill. Don't tell her that I did that. Um, <laughs> you want to tell the child specifically what you want them to do. So for example, please put the noisemaker down rather than behave. Okay? You want to avoid the vague commands of parenthood. Behave, be careful, watch out, be good, hey. Uh, my kids, when they were three to five, had a great soccer coach. Lovely gentleman. Uh, he was an ex-football player, and like a lot of us coaching soccer, had never played soccer before. But if you know anything about three to five-year-olds playing soccer, it's kind of a herd mentality, right? You know, they just kind of go in one big group here and one big group here. Well, and it's not uncommon for a four-year-old to get kicking the ball the wrong way. And he'll be kicking the ball the wrong way down the, down the court, and this coach would go, what are you thinking? And the child, what would he do? No, he would stop and try to figure out what he was thinking. <laughs> you know, young children really don't have that good metacognitive skills yet. And invariably, it did not result in a good outcome for our little team. Because, you know, rather than saying, what are you thinking, please kick the ball toward the other goal. A little more effective. And so it's one of those things. And by the way, that is not just that coach. If you ever watch coaches coach, a lot of them will give very indirect commands and very vague commands. And the kids are going, I'm trying to do what you're telling me to do. So you want specific and positive. You also want your commands to be developmentally appropriate. You want simple, understandable commands. For example, please put up the toy rather than please put up the chauvinistic, unrealistic, 1 16th scale replica of a female. Uh, be, <laughs> it takes a minute. But anyway, because we are going to provide consequences for disobedience, we want to make sure that we're giving commands that the child can obey. Interestingly enough, a lot of times what I see, this is with colors. Uh, a lot of times parents think their three and four-year-olds have their colors down when the three and four-year-olds may not have the colors down yet. And, uh, but you, or sometimes they'll ask them to draw things that they're not able to draw or to maneuver things they're not able to maneuver. So you want to make sure that the commands are developmentally appropriate. You want to give commands very politely and respectfully. Uh, you want to give your commands in, a, in just a neutral conversational tone of voice. Many of us, we have what I call the parental ah that gets into our voice, right? Matthew, you come over here right minute, right this minute. You know, John Phillip. Right now, right, we get that ah uh, in our voice. <laughs> well, there's a problem with that. The problem with giving, giving commands in this rah, 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 tone of voice is about threefold. One is that it teaches kids that you only mean business when you've got the ah uh, going. And so they are not as likely to obey you when you're talking in a calm tone of voice. Okay, and this kind of hurts them when they get to school when hopefully the teacher is giving them directives in a calm tone of voice. Okay. Also, there's some research that indicates that when we shout at children, it gets their, uh, it gets their adrenaline flowing and, it's, and kids actually will, are less likely to obey a shouted command than a spoken command. And so we want to give commands very politely or socially. And the third reason, and this is a bad reason, Okay, 
It's, it's culturally appropriate in my culture in the South, but it's still a bad reason. We as parents, we do like to look good. And it really looks good when you can tell your child, please come over here and stand by me, and they obey, right? Or please, you know, please uh, put your feet down, uh, all, you know, on the floor, rather than, you know, don't kick your chair around, right? And they obey. It just looks kind of good. And even though as parents we really shouldn't be worried about if it looks good or not, sometimes we're worried if it looks good or not. And so uh, it does kind of help you look good as a parent. Explanations, okay, when you give commands, explanations should be used either before a command or after the child has obeyed. Explanations are good, and you want to give explanations for commands. Kids are much more likely to obey if they know why they're, they're obeying. But the timing is critical. For example, you want to say, we are about to leave for the store. Please put on your coat. Or, please pick up the cars, and the child obeys. Thank you for picking up the cars. Now the house is safer, and we won't trip on the cars. This gives your child attention for obeying. What you don't want to do is give explanations after the why. Please, put up, please pick up the cars. Why? Well, because it, it will help your sister be safe. Well, she can step around them, right? And by giving explanations after the command but before obedience, you get into what sometimes I call lawyering behavior with children. And, and they will forget the original command because they start arguing with you and getting rather oppositional. And so you want to give your explanations either before a command or after the child is obeyed. You also only want to give commands, you only want to give commands when it is necessary. You don't want to become a drill sergeant. I always tell parents, we are about to uh, give you a very good tool in helping you manage your child's behavior. We don't want you to abuse it. And if you just become drill sergeant and you are giving 50, 100 commands a day, the child is going to become bored and it's not going to become a really good interaction between you and the child. And so you, all, you only want to give commands when it's important. And some of y'all may be like me. Some of y'all may. There are times when I, as a parent, will give a command, and then after I get, make something a command, my, I, I will realize, you know, I really don't care if they're going to do that or not, right? You know, for, for example, uh, uh, please eat, you know, uh, you know, please pick some peas out, you know, on, on the table. Well, I don't, we've got peas, we've got broccoli. I don't care if they have peas or broccoli. And it's okay to have a choice, you know. You know, they're both green, they're both vegetables. You can have the peas or the broccoli. And, uh, and so it's important to know when to give those choices and when to make it a command. Sometimes uh, we're a big believer in my household of teaching our kids to cook. Uh, my 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 twelve year old boy he he has about twelve different dishes that he can make. Uh, he cooks better than most of his babysitters, <laughs> and um, and one of the tricks is we invite our kids into the kitchen to help us. Okay, uh, and when you and any of y'all who've taught a child to cook know this. How is it more work to cook a meal yourself or to have your kid help? It is much more work to have a kid help. And so there are times that I say, would you like to help me cook? And if they say yes, great. They get to learn a valuable life skill. If they say no, great. I get to eat 15 minutes earlier. Okay? <laughs> and, you know, choices are a good thing. And, uh, and we want to give those choices to our kids. So by not giving too many commands, we make it easier for the child to follow them. We give them opportunities to learn. Yes? What, that they give too many commands? Yes. Uh, and it's really interesting because when you work with PCIT, one of the things that you'll start to notice is that there are parents who really need CDI because they are very authoritarian and they are very strict and they're, they're inconsistent and harsh a lot of times. And they so need the CDI. And there are some kids, by the way, that they almost have, they have sometimes what we call in the business CDI cures. It's like that mostly what this child needed was their parents to play with them. Okay? Then there's other parents 
who really need the PDI. There's other parents, and you can see this in your first 15-minute ZPICS assessment session, that the child is running the household and, uh, and that the parents need to take control. But definitely authoritarian parents will sometimes use this a little too much. Excellent question. All right. Well, any questions about commands? Yes, ma'am. What about like moms that are obsessed with having the house clean and they could give 50 commands alone on pick that up, put that there, no dishes in the sink, no, 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 no. Like, yeah. what do you, how do you deal with that? Sure. Wh quite honestly, one of the ways that we would deal with that is make them go through the PDI process because by breaking those commands down, and then waiting for the child to comply, uh, it, that would become a very disruptive process for the, for the parent to keep you know, going on and on and on. And sometimes we do have discussions about what is developmentally appropriate expectations. Uh, you know, it is developmentally appropriate for your six-year-old to help to pick up their toys. It is developmentally appropriate for your six-year-old to set the table, put the dishes in the sink. Probably not developmentally, developmentally appropriate for them to be scrubbing the toilets with a toothbrush <laughs> to make sure that everything is clean. Do you get moms that try to get their kids doing all that? Online or no? Honestly, I usually have the opposite. I, okay. I usually have moms that are not giving their children enough responsibility around the household. And that's kind of the pendulum swing that we're on now. Uh, we, uh, we have been on a pendulum swing from authoritarian parents to permissive parenting, and we kind of need to get folks toward that middle ground. But definitely, if you have somebody who has obsessive compulsive personality disorder and they're passing that on to their children, you would need to confront that. All right, well, with no further ado, we are going to now take you through the steps of PDI with uh, Rhea.